and share it with 11 Alive News using Near Me on the 11 Alive News app. Here's a photo of the storm that a viewer sent to us. Download the 11 Alive News app to use Near Me. News happens fast. Stream it faster. 11 Alive News is now on Roku. Stream live newscast. We begin tonight with breaking news. And watch on demand. We are tracking severe storms. 11 Alive News, stream now on Roku. It's tougher than ever to tell if something on social media is fact or fiction. That's what makes 11 Alive News different. We verify, and we're the only ones in Metro Atlanta doing it. Verify takes stories and claims that have gone viral, sources that information, and then we vet it with the experts. So you can be confident you're getting the facts every time. If you haven't watched Verify, see the difference on the 11 Alive Morning News and at 11 p.m. Weather can't run from the 11 Alive Thunder Truck. A mobile weather center with the power and speed to chase down the strongest storms and bring you on Psalm 46, verses 1 through 11. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change, though the mountains shake in the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble with tumult. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of that city, it shall not be moved. God will help it when the morning dawns. The nations are in uproar. The kingdoms totter. He utters his voice. The earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Come, behold the works of the Lord. See what desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I am exalted among the nations. I am exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. The hymn is in your hymnal number 378, Amazing Grace. As you're able, we invite you to stand as we sing stanzas one, two, three, and six, Amazing Grace.
First, let me thank Diane and the Isaacson family for allowing me to be a part of Johnny's service today. And all of us in this beautiful sanctuary that knew Johnny so well know that he is now in a better place. As I look at the Penley painting, he is looking down at us with that Johnny Isaacson smile and twinkle in his eye and happy to be out of pain and suffering. Now a reading from the Philippians. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving. Present your request to God. And in the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your heart and your minds in Christ Jesus. Uh, first, I would, I would like to, to note that a lot has been shared, a lot has been said publicly, uh, stories, memories, thoughts and prayers, and, and articles, in texts, and in emails, and in, in letters. And on behalf of our family, I, I want to say thank you. Uh, you know, e each makes a difference. We say them all, and we appreciate the kind words, the kind thoughts, and prayers. Uh, a couple years ago, my father fell uh, when he was in Washington. Uh, Heath and I, Heath Garrett and I, my mom was there to help my dad, and Heath Garrett and I flew to assist my dad in getting back home. Uh, you know, it was that time, I think, started to realize, okay, you know, the, the change is coming. Um, I can't stay here in Washington forever. It's that time I, too, started to see that that change perhaps was coming. And on that very plane flight, I just started to jot down notes, stories, things that, I, things that would come to mind, things that I would remember. Over the past few years in particular, I'd make certain to note stories my dad would share with me. He was a bit nostalgic and he would remember a lot and he'd want to make certain that I did too and I'd jot it down. And ultimately I believed all that would be the culmination of, or would, with a combination of all that would be what I would sit and, and share today. But, but by gosh, it got to be pages. It got to be pages and I had trouble breaking it all down succinctly into a story or or two or three that would, that would share what my father meant to me and all that he, he provided me and provided my family. And, you know, I, I remembered a trick he had. I actually saw this for the first time when he gave his acceptance speech when he was first elected uh, to Congress. And he, he had probably given a 15 or 20 minute speech and the family had joined him up at the dais we were around the podium, and, and on the podium was, was a note card just like this. It had his name on the top, as mine does. It said Johnny Isaacson, and it was a plus sign. And in each corner, there were four, you know, there was a word, ultimately four words upon which he spoke. And I said, well, I got I to gotta, I gotta, I gotta take another trick out of my dad's playbook. And I tell you, in my lifetime, I've taken a lot. I'm going to take a lot more as future. But I took a trick out of my dad's playbook, and sat there and looked at what I wrote, and I said, what, what, is, what does all this mean? And, you know, in the first corner, I, I wrote, thanks. I wanted to be sure to offer thanks on behalf of our family to all those who had shared so, who have shared so much to us. In the other corner, I put the word time. When I looked at all those stories, 
When I looked at all those shared experiences, all the times we laughed, all the times we cried, all the times I listened to him, and all the things I learned, I realized he had given me such a great gift. Every moment he had, he gave me his time. I could not have asked for anything more. I also looked at those words and I remembered my dad and most any time that I saw him, he would tell me how proud he was of me. You know, there may have been a specific event or an act that was deserving. A lot of times there weren't or there wasn't, but he wanted to know and I know how proud he was. The other word, the final word is love. I never ended a phone call with my father. We never parted company where he didn't say, son, I love you. My father gave me a great deal of his time every minute he could. I know my father is very proud of me and I'm very proud of him. And I know how much he loved me and I loved him, I love him. You know, as I've shared these stories with my family over the past few weeks, you know, I was, I'm fortunate, I just, I just lived a mile, if that, from where my dad lived. And my kids started to jump in, and my, you know, it wasn't dad, it was pops. Pops to the grandkids, it really became pops to all of us, but it was pops, and my kids started to show, you know what, dad? Pops was just the same to us. Every Friday when he got home from Washington, sure enough, he'd stop by the house and whoever was there, he was gonna check in on them. How are they doing? How's your week? You know, my dad would exercise, particularly as the Parkinson weighed in, and he would walk up to my house. It was about a mile, it was uphill, and he'd get up and I was at the top of the hill. He'd, sure enough, he'd come in and take a break. He'd sit down and he'd have a cup of water and whoever was there, he was gonna check in and find out who's going, what's going on. You know, I found my dad, I was very fortunate for my kids, for my family, my dad, much the same as he always gave me, was able to give my family, my wife, my three children, his time. And they shared with me, just like every time he left my company, he left theirs, he said, I'm proud of all y'all, and I love you. I'm very fortunate for that, I'm very fortunate for the time I had, for the time my family had with my father, it's those thoughts it's those memories that carry me today and will carry us forward. My dad is a great father. He will always be a great father and it's in these memories that I'll cherish for a lifetime. Thank you. Well, this isn't a daunting task at all. <laughs> Follow up my brother. Sitting here in front of everybody, it's hard to imagine when I thought about this where I was gonna find the words. You know, I read all the lengthy and numerous tributes to dad and I thought, well, certainly as one of his kids, I can offer something that's insightful and personal and memorable that really sums up the essence of his greatness. And then Stephanie told me the service was only going to be an hour and a half and I wasn't the only speaker. <laughs> and I said, well, that's not going to be enough time. As a matter of fact, there's not enough hours in a week. Top it off, I wasn't real sure the words had been invented that would do him justice. But nonetheless, I opened my laptop and started doing a little research, thought about the Bible, Shakespeare, Thomas Jefferson, Thomas Paine, Thomas Carlyle, George Washington, anybody I could think of who might have a scripture or a passage or a quote that would, that would do dad justice and sum everything up. Now, as I was doing that, I realized one wasn't going to be enough. 
I was going to have to string together a myriad of them to really encompass all the great facets that Dad had, all the wonderful things that he was about. And I realized, well, I don't want to just string together a bunch of other people's words. I want this to be personal. So I said, you know, I'll weave in analogies and comparisons, funny stories and anecdotes, make it my own, and, you know, maybe that'll be enough. Well, I got started, big task. I got about 10 pages in, closed my eyes, laid my head back, and I had this flash of a memory from middle school. I had a class and we had a public speaking unit and I knew dad was in politics. I sort of knew what that meant at the time. I knew it meant he gave speeches and he was pretty good at it. I wanted to impress him. I wanted to make him proud. So I paid attention in class and researched my topic and wrote my notes down, made my note cards, numbered them in the top right hand corner, just like the teacher said. Practiced a little bit, went into the den and said, dad, I want to give you my speech. He said, son, that's great. He said, what are those note cards for? I said, well, Dad, the teacher told us we organize our thoughts. This keeps us on track. It's going to make the speech go better. He said, son, that's a great idea. He said, but you know what? If you know what you're talking about, you don't need notes. Come over here. <sighs> Sit next to me. Let's talk about it. So I did. And for the next 10 or 15 minutes, I got the best advice anybody's ever gotten about how to talk to people, about how to talk about a topic, about how to speak in public. And I think in that moment, that was dad at his best, teaching a lesson with kindness and compassion. Let's just hope it's stuck. So I kept working. I'm almost to the end. I've got about 25 pages in front of me. I've got the scripture and passages and quotes. I've got my analogies and comparisons, funny anecdotes and stories, and I'm ready for the big conclusion, something that's gonna tie it all together. Another thought hits me. We all know how Dad loved democracy in America, and I thought about Abraham Lincoln, the Gettysburg Address. You know, Lincoln wasn't even the featured speaker that day at the commemoration of the cemetery. Edward Everett spoke for two hours, one of the most famous orators of his day. He did that before Lincoln ever took the stage. When Lincoln got up there and gave what he called his little speech, 272 words, less than two minutes, Gettysburg Address is widely considered the most eloquent articulation of the American vision for democracy that's ever been spoken or written. Nobody knows who Edward Everett is or remembers that there was anybody else on that stage. And I am positive there's a lesson in there somewhere if I think about it long enough. <laughs> so there I was and I'd finished. I got my conclusion. I had everything that was gonna tie it up my long, eloquent, flowering tribute to my father, talking about how great he was, how much he meant to me, how special he was, how much I appreciated him, how much I loved him, how grateful I am that he made me the man I am today. And I thought again about the middle school public speaking lesson. Gettysburg Address, 272 words, less than two minutes, widely considered the most eloquent articulation of the American vision for democracy that's ever been spoken or written. I thought, well, if it's that good, maybe I'll just borrow a little bit. So with apologies to President Lincoln, I know the world will little note, nor long remember what I say here, but it will never forget what dad did here. 23 words, five, six seconds. If less is more, 
That sounds about right. He was that great. I loved him very much. I will miss him every day. Thank you. I'm going for less than 227 words. <clears throat> Dad has received a lot of wonderful tributes about his tremendous accomplishments in life. But his greatest success doesn't ever get enough publicity, and that's being a father. All my life, people asked what it was like to have a dad as a public figure someone in the limelight, and I never knew how to answer it, because to me, he was just dad. Growing up, we took family vacations together. He let me beat him in made-up card games. We spent weekends at the lake tubing and skiing. He gave us horsey bites and rib ronkers. He came to my soccer games. He made the best barbecue ribs and super sandwiches. He taught me how to drive. He waited up for me to come home at night. He bought the keg for my college graduation party. <laughs> Go dogs. He guided me as I started my career, and he walked me down this aisle when I got married and he was at the hospital when my children were born. And after that, the first thing Dad ever asked about were his grandkids. Dad was a lot of things to a lot of people, but he was my dad, and he was the best. The hymn is number 77, How Great Thou Art. As you are able, we invite you to stand as we sing hymn 77.
Good afternoon. I'm Bill Clark, and I was a friend and neighbor with Johnny Isaacson for 40 plus years. I first heard Johnny's name when IBM moved our family from Alexandria, Virginia to Atlanta for a promotion in 1976. We worked with Virginia Connolly, who was a real estate agent that worked for Johnny's firm, Northside Realty. So Diane and I came down on our house hunting trip, looked at various homes in the north side, all lovely homes, nice neighborhoods, but then we found a special place. We ended up buying the house from a guy that I replaced as sales manager in this neighborhood called River Hill and Hampton Farms, which is truly a special and magical neighborhood that we lived in for 45 years. And as a quirk of fate, our house was six doors up the street from Johnny and Diane's new house that they were building. So in the beginning and over the years, we knew their family, but mostly through their kids. There was the neighborhood pool, all those swim meets, community events, and of course, the great East Cobb schools. His son, John Andrew, and my daughter, Ashley, were school bus buddies, back when it was cool to be on the school bus. His son, Kevin, played football, and his future wife, Catherine, and my daughter, Sarah, were cheerleaders for Walton High School. And then when Kevin, Catherine, and Sarah graduated, Johnny gave the commencement speech. Now, now I had not heard Johnny give a real speech until that point, but I heard him speak many times over the years. As John said, what a gifted and exceptional speaker he was. I got to know Johnny a lot better socially through the groups his Diane and my Diane were part of. There was a luncheon group called the Gourmet Gluttons or as they call themselves, the pigs. <laughs> they got together every month, and twice a year, they invited the husbands for events at their homes or up at the lake. And then there was the famous East Cobb Samoa gift shop, where both Diane's and several of their friends worked for many years with a lot of help from Julia all those years. There would be Christmas parties, and once again, the husbands were invited. And eventually, it was the beginning of the annual New Year's Eve parties. That went on for 20 plus years. And then, there were the weddings. Lots and lots of weddings, several right here in this beautiful space. Not only our neighborhood kids, but our own children. And how can we not forget the excitement when Johnny was first elected to Congress and a lot of his friends and neighbors and families. We got on that Delta flight, we went up to Washington and watched him get sworn in. And then several later, years later, he's back on the plane again. We're back to Washington for Johnny's inauguration as our very own senator from Georgia. Thanks to Bank and Sh Banks and Shane for entertaining that night. But something really special happened in 2005. Diane got a call from Diane saying, what are you and Bill doing in August of this year? didn't have any real plans, said, well, John's friend, Johnny's friend, John, uh, John Williams, has offered his sailboat in the Mediterranean, and he wants you all and one other couple to be part of a seven-day cruise on the Amalfi Coast. How lucky were we to get that phone call? The other couple was Bob and Rosemarie Phillips, who were Johnny's longtime friends in real estate. 
In that trip, it was a truly a pinch me moment. Are we really here? And it was such a memorable and fun occasion that we decided to continue getting together every August when Johnny was on his congressional break. And oh, the places we did go, from Italy to Ireland, to Quebec City, to Bermuda, Lake Winnipesaukee, and Atlanta, and many other places. Our August gang, that's what we called ourselves. We did that for 14 straight years. Good times, amazing friendships, in very special places. And you know what, we would always say each time, you know what, it doesn't get any better than this. Our final get together was in 2018. Johnny had arranged a dinner and a meeting with his good friend, John Lewis. What an exceptional evening that was. You know, I'm so very proud of Johnny, not only for his outstanding record as a member of Congress, but for being such a major part of our magical neighborhood and group of friends. He was a loving husband. He loved his kids. And boy, did he love his grandkids. He was a fair, he was fair and honest, respected and admired, generous and kind, the epitome of a gentleman, and a dear friend to me and to all that knew him. I was so fortunate to have lunch with Johnny the week before he passed away without my good friend, Shel Anderson. And I was so glad that I was able to give Johnny a goodbye hug that day. In closing, I would just like to say, thank God for Johnny Isaacson and continued blessings to the Isaacson family because we love you all. Thank you. Good afternoon. It's going to be the easy part for me. <laughs> First to, um, to Diane, Julie, John, Kevin, thank you for giving me the opportunity to say something about my longtime friend and someone who had such an impact on my life. I know how much he loved all of you guys and the grandchildren. There were many weekends and holidays that we were stuck in the Senate waiting on a vote. And we had the opportunity to talk about how we wished that we were at home with our families. Now, there none of us um, have any idea what the protocol was over the last several days when Johnny faced St. Peter. But there's one thing that I know for certain. Standing right beside at St. Peter was Tom Coburn. And Coburn, when his inimitable way whispered to St. Peter, he said, this is the guy I've been telling you about. And with him joining our team, we're going to get some good things done. If Johnny had lived nine more days, he would have had his 77th birthday. 
I was privileged to be his friend for 59 of those years. Johnny and I entered the University of Georgia <coughs> in the fall of 1962 and became good friends early on. He was an SA and I was an SA, a Sigma Chi, but the Greek system in those days was so small that we had a lot of interaction between fraternities through athletics, parties, etc. As senators, we often introduced each other at various uh, very events. And when Johnny always introduced me, he would say, we dated at the FAMU uh, house together, not the same girl. <laughs> Saxby dated Diane, uh, Julianne and I dated Diane. It was a great time to be a student at the University of Georgia. In fact, I see some of our classmates around here in this congregation that took a four-year education and struck it out, uh, str strung it out for another five years. Uh, <laughs> a couple of them may be you, uh, six years, but. Johnny and I lived the fullest, to the, the, the life to the fullest in those years. We were both together in the business school and shared an occasional class. Johnny was a great student and his inclination of politics was early on when he uh, was elected as president of SAE. During out our years at UGA, Coach Dooley showed up and revived our football program. College life in those days was really good. <laughs> now again, I don't know what St. Peter has in the way of protocols, but I can tell you, next Monday night, Johnny is gonna be watching the dogs <laughs> wear out Alabama. Now, for several years after we graduated, we, our paths didn't cross very often. I went off to law school and was building a law practice in 200 miles south of Atlanta, and Johnny was building his very successful real estate practice here. And at the same time, he was entering the same political, uh, he was a entering, entering the political arena. Now, just like some of my many colleagues over here, I lost my first campaign for Congress, and Johnny lost his first campaign for the State House. But that moment, his political career took off like a rocket. He ran again two years later, and that election started a string of seven straight campaign wins from 1976 to 1988 for the State House. He was one of a very few Republicans in the Georgia House where he quickly rose to be the minority leader. In 1990, he ran for governor and lost in a tough campaign to Zell Miller. He returned to the campaign trail two years later and was elected to the Georgia State Senate. In 1996, he lost in a primary for the U.S. Senate, but in 1999, he won the race to replace Newt Gingrich for the U.S. House. He then ran successfully for the U.S. Senate in 2004 and was reelected in 2010 and 2016, becoming the first Georgia Republican in history to serve in the United States Senate for three terms. In addition, he is the only Georgian to serve in the Georgia House and Senate and the U.S. House and Senate. Wow, what a spectacular career. When Johnny resigned in 
2019 from the Senate. His politic career, political career had spanned 45 years, 39 of those years in elected office. When you include the two and, two and a half years he served as chairman of the State Board of Education, appointed by then Governor Zell Miller, he served our state and our country for more than 41 of those 45 years. His election record was 14 wins and three losses. Johnny's good friend, Bobby Cox, would love to have had all of his Braves pitchers with that same record. When you know Johnny, it was easy to see how such a successful, uh, how had he such a political career. He summed it on the floor of the Senate in his farewell speech on December 3rd, 2019, when he said two things. One, all I have out there are friends and future friends. And two, when he was discussing his voting philosophy, he quoted Mark Twain, who once said, when confronted with a difficult decision, do what is right. You will surprise a few and amaze the rest. He particularly loved to vote for a bipartisan pill and authored an awful a lot of bipartisan legislation. He was very proud to work with Republicans and Democrats on a regular basis. His longtime good friend, former Governor Roy Barnes, has oft said of Johnny, that if all Republicans were like Johnny Isaacson, I would be a Republican. <laughs> now, I enjoyed my years in the House with Johnny, but those 10 years we had together in the United Senate were very special. We talked every day, often four, time, four five, six, seven times a day, about what was going on in the Senate and what was going on back in Georgia. I saw the real Johnny up close and personal with those regular conversations. We were tested over and over with difficult decisions, immigration, the debt, the TARP program, nominations, and many, many more. As we had our discussions about all of those votes, the conversation always came back to Mark Twain's words, we got to do what is right. His passing leaves a void in our hearts, in our state, and in our nation. I will close with a verse for one of my favorite Vince Gill songs that sums up my personal feelings on this day as we say goodbye to Johnny. Go rest high on that mountain. Some your work on earth is done. Go to heaven a shouting, love for the Father and to the Son. I will miss you, my faithful friend. Amen. Kevin, John, and Julie. You know, in the United States Senate, 
a lot comes down to attendance. Do you have the votes? Do you have a quorum? It's all about who shows up. Well, I haven't seen this big or bipartisan a group of senators together off the floor since September. So what happened in September, you're wondering? Well, it was the annual Johnny Isaacson barbecue lunch was restarted in his honor. Two years before that, when Johnny gave his farewell speech, the chamber was packed with Republicans, Democrats, and staff like I hadn't seen since Bob Dole left the Senate in 1996. Now, we all know this is a polarized time. Unity is in short supply. But the gigantic and diverse Johnny Isaacson fan club has never failed to pack a room. Johnny Isaacson told the truth. He played by the rules. He treated everybody with respect an unfailing kindness, a gentleman in the literal sense, a gentle man. To be clear, our colleague was a savvy legislator, a cunning deal maker. There wasn't a naive bone in his body. But Johnny's achievements didn't come in spite of his quiet virtues, they came because of those virtues. Johnny, the remarkable senator, was a direct result of Johnny, the Sunday school teacher. St. Paul's letter to the Hebrews, chapter 10, offers a kind of mission statement for Christian friendship. He writes, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. That was Johnny. His kindness made all of us kinder. His dedication made us more dedicated. A genuine, generous love for others literally beamed from Johnny like the rays of the sun. And just a short moment in that warmth was enough to leave you thinking that just maybe, just maybe on your best day, you could love the people around you half as well as Johnny did on his worst day. There's a playfulness in that verse from scripture that captures why I'll miss my friend so very much. St. Paul doesn't just say to inspire love and good works. He says we should stir them up. Another translation says, provoke. Now, does that sound like anybody we know? Johnny was a master of the sly smile, a virtuoso of the one-liner. I would hear peals of laughter echo through my office. Turned out, Johnny had gone around me and was lobbying my staff directly. <laughs> Charm on full blast, twinkle in his eye. Johnny faced challenges, an illness, a retirement that came entirely too soon. But through it all, Johnny lived as though his yoke were easy, his burdens light. You suffered, St. Paul continues later, but do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. Persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. 
And this is why we have gathered in God's house to honor our friend, but even more to give thanks for an amazing reality. The reality that as dearly as we love Johnny, our Father in heaven knows him even better and loves him even more than we ever could. Johnny's time with us may have ended, but we trust that his eternity in that even greater love has just begun. And I don't know about you, but I feel pretty certain that the halls of heaven were filled to capacity with everyone who wanted to welcome Johnny firsthand, shake his hand, share a laugh, hear his stories. I bet it was standing room only. The Johnny Isaacson fan club never fails to pack a room. Reading from the Holy Gospel according to John, Jesus said to his disciples, do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house, there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself so that where I am, there you may be also. The Gospel of the Lord. Kevin, John, Julie, precious Diane, thank you so much for this honor for me to be at this celebration of the life of my dear friend and prayer partner. Johnny and I met at a Senate prayer breakfast in 2004. We bonded almost immediately, but what he did not know was that my first serious girlfriend was from Lithonia, Georgia. <clears throat> and his lilting Georgia accent and lyrical baritone pretty much had me at hello. I was, I was, I, 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 I just, we bonded. Uh, the bond grew even deeper when I learned that Georgia has macaroni and cheese that's about the best I've ever had. I learned that at his barbecue. So he became an unofficial mentor in many, many ways. And after a couple of months, he suggested that we become prayer partners. Now, I could see my initiating for us to become prayer partners, but he initiated. 
for us to become prayer partners. And I said, that's a wonderful idea. And he said, are you thinking what I'm thinking? And I said, if you are thinking Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 12, I am. For it states two are better than one. For if one is cold, there is someone to get you warm. If one falls, there is someone to help you up. If one is attacked, there is someone to help you defend. And a three-strand cord is not easily broken. Johnny taught me a little something, Diane, about prayer. And that's why the scripture, Philippians 4, 6, and 7, is in our bulletin. Have no anxiety about anything. What, what amazing admonition. Have no anxiety about anything but pray about everything with thanksgiving. Verse 7 says, Philippians 4, and the peace of God that passes understanding will guard your heart and mine in Christ Jesus. The caller ID on my phone for Johnny is prayer partner. And I believe my caller ID on his phone is prayer partner because when I ring him, I hear the words, hello, prayer partner. And the same happens when he rings me. We literally prayed about everything. For nothing is too small or too great to bring to God in prayer. The hymnist put it this way, Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pains we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. I remember the challenge of learning about his illness, the many prayers we prayed about decisions that would be made or should not be made. And then he said something I never expected to hear him say, because we're not very far apart in age. He, he said, I want you to to speak at my memorial service. I said, come on. But as we continued in the weeks and the months would go on, he would often say, I want you to speak at my memorial service. Prayer partner. And it dawned on me, this brother is ready. This brother is finishing strong. And I thought about another mentor of mine, the late Dr. William Augustus Jones, pastored for 50 years in New York, Bethany Baptist Church in New York, great, great man of God. And I said to Dr. Jones, are you afraid of anything 6'5", linebacker physique? Are you afraid of anything? And with his baritone voice, he said, Barry, I'm afraid of three things. I'm afraid that my body will outlast my mind. I want cognitive clarity to the very end. He said, second, I, I'm afraid I may outlive my mourners.
He said, when it comes time for me to transition, I want somebody to be sorry that I am transitioning from time into eternity. And I thought that was hyperbolic until, as a Navy chaplain who officiated at quite a few funerals for a veteran cemetery, I, I actually conducted a graveside service for a 99-year-old bachelor sailor, and no one showed up. He had outlived his mourners. So as the coffin went down into the grave, the crane lowered it. I recited the 23rd Psalm, and that was the end. I don't want to outlive my mourners. But then Dr. Jones said, there is one thing that terrifies me even more than those two. And I said, well, what is that? He said, I don't want to drown in shallow water. I said, that sounds clever, Doc. What does it mean? He said, I don't want to, after doing the business of God on the high seas, in deep water, navigating around the treacherous shoals of life, to approach the harbor, can see loved ones standing there waiting for me, approach the harbor and do something stupid, do something scandalous and drown in shallow water. I want to finish strong. Johnny finished strong. He reminds me of the words of the tent maker from Tarsus to his protege, Timothy, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, 6 through 8. The Apostle Paul was in his second imprisonment in Rome. The first one was like house arrest. He could have guests. And it was very easy, you know, minimum security. The second one, Brother Nero, was in charge. And it was austere, and Paul knew he did not have long to live around A.D. 64. He wrote his second epistle, his letter to Timothy. He told Timothy in chapter 2, endure hardness like a good soldier. He told him in chapter 3, verse 12, all those who live godly, will suffer persecution. But he continued in verse 16, all scripture is God-breathed and it will make you equipped for all good works. So study to show yourself approved unto God. Back to chapter 2 and verse 15, a workman that need not be ashamed. But then... Paul's valedictory words, I am now ready to die. And the time of my departure is at hand. I've fought a good fight. I've finished my race. I've kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, praise God, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but to all those who love his appearing. And my prayer partner loved his Savior and longed for his appearing. That's why we've got John 14, 1 to 3. My prayer partner loved this passage. Let not your hearts be troubled. I think that explains some of the equanimity of temperament and peace that he had. Let not your hearts be troubled. We have control over our affect the internal, how we respond to life's vicissitudes. 
Ye believe in God, believe also in me, in my Father's house. <laughs> are many mansions. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you will be also. Johnny fought the good fight. He believed that God was his refuge and strength, a very present help in the time of trouble. Johnny finished the race. He finished it in an exemplary way. It wasn't easy. It wasn't a sprint. It was a marathon. And the running that he had to do to finish that race, Matthew 24, 13, those who endure to the end will be saved. The running that he had to do, I'm reminded of the austerity of it in the words of James Weldon Johnson's poem, Stony the road we trod, bitter the chastening rod felt in the days when hope unborn had died. How do you kill hope in the womb when hope unborn had died? Yet with a steady beat have not our weary feet come to the place for which our forebears sighed. And Johnny kept running toward the finish line to finish strong. We have come over a way that with tears has been watered. We have come treading our path through the blood of the slaughtered. Out of the gloomy past, until now we stand at last where the white gleams of our bright hopes are cast. He finished the race. He could say, it is finished. Prayer partner, I want you to speak at my memorial service. So Johnny fought the good fight and finished the race, but oh my, prayer partner kept the faith. In the Greek, there's a notion of contract. Johnny knew real estate and he knew about contracts. Johnny had a contract with Jesus Christ, the one he loved more than life itself. The contract is found in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, for it is by grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourself. My prayer partner knew it is a gift from God, not by works, lest anyone should boast. I don't think in heaven we're going to be referring to one another as the honorable. Peter, this is the honorable. I don't think in heaven we're going to be having military rank. Have you met general so-and-so? In fact, every time the Holy Spirit impresses my heart, he calls me Barry. He doesn't seem to be impressed with any title that I may possess. Johnny kept his part of the contract. What is Johnny's part of the contract? It is not the labors of my hands can fulfill the law's demands. Could my zeal no respite know? Could my tears forever flow? None of this for sin could atone. Thou must save 
and thou alone. I'm going to see my prayer partner soon and very soon. And what a day it's going to be. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God. The dead in Christ shall rise first, then we who are alive and remain shall, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17, caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And I love this. So shall we ever be with the Lord. We've heard about some impressive neighborhoods, but I want my mansion to be somewhere near Hallelujah Boulevard near Johnny's place. And I hope that up there, some of that good Georgia barbecue and macaroni and cheese can be served at the welcome table. God bless and keep you is my prayer. Would you stand for the benediction? Methodist minister friend of mine was gathered at the cemetery with the family for the final leg of their journey with their loved one. And the funeral home director came over to him and said, now after you pronounce the benediction, step aside, the woman with the baskets is going to take over. My friend said, the woman with the baskets, what's she going to do? He said, it's okay, just watch. Sure enough, he conducted the graveside, offered the benediction, and stepped aside. The woman with the basket said, would everybody come out from under the tent? And when they did, she lifted the lid on the first basket, and a dove flew out. And she lifted the lids on other baskets, and more doves flew out. And they circled overhead, and they flew off. And my friend went over to her, and he said, that was really impressive, but how are you going to get those doves back in the baskets? 
And she said, honey, I'm not worried about that. They know the way home, and they'll be waiting on me when I get there. In a similar way, Johnny knows his way home, and he will be waiting on us when we get there. And so we say to him, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. Now receive God's blessing. May the road rise to meet you. May the wind be always at your back. May the sun shine warm upon your face. And may the rain fall softly upon your fields. And until we meet again, may God hold you in the palm of his hand. Amen. Watching and listening in to the memorial service for the late former Georgia U.S. Senator and businessman Johnny Isaacson. This is inside Peachtree Road United Methodist Church. You can see a beautiful portrait of the late Senator two bouquets of flowers there right on the stage. A number of Republican and Democratic lawmakers in the church. On this Thursday, we saw a number of faces in the crowd. U.S. Senator Ted Cruz, Atlanta Mayor Andre Dickens, former U.S. Senator Kelly Leffler, and a number of speakers, including his longtime friend, U.S. Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell, also former U.S. Senator Saxby Shambliss, who did get emotional at times as he spoke about his longtime friend. We also heard from Johnny Isaacson's three children. Kevin talking about all the times that they laughed, all the time that they cried, but that he remembered his dad most by his stories. And John talking about how his dad taught him about speaking in public with kindness and compassion. And his daughter, Julie, saying that his greatest success doesn't get enough publicity and is that of being a dad. I'll tell you, as, as I listened to this over the last 90 minutes, I, I really thought the symbolism of this ceremony today and the one year anniversary of the insurrection at the U.S. Capitol and how Senator Isaacson was 180 degrees from the events of 365 days ago. He was a man who always heard various sides to issues, uh, to American life. Uh, he was that way in business at Northside Realty. He was that way at the University of Georgia. He was that way as a young man growing up in Atlanta. His whole life was predicated by respect toward others, by decency, by doing the right thing, by doing th the right things when they were not easy, when they were hard. But Johnny Isaacson always stood up. First elected to the Georgia State uh, House in 1976. He had run in 1974 and he had lost. And, and one of the things about Johnny Isaacson that I, I think you really, you really take away from his life is defeats. He, he had many public defeats, whether it was running for, uh, you know, governor. in 1990 as governor, mm -hmm. only to come back and later in his life, uh, he won. And, and his victories in life certainly were amplified today at this, uh, this amazing, remarkable, and moving remembrance of him. Uh, the U.S. Senate Chaplain Barry Black mm. was unforgettable. If, if, yeah. if you have not seen this, you can go to 11 Alive, our YouTube channel. I'm sure we're going to be showing this over, but it gives great pause for reflection for mm. all of our lives and, and the meaning of Senator Isaacson's life in Atlanta, in Georgia, yeah. in the nation, in Washington, D.C. Yeah, his prayer partner since 2004, Jeff, U.S. Senate Chaplain Barry Black, he says that Johnny fought the good fight. He finished the race in an exemplary way. And we will have much more from today's memorial service on 11 Alive News beginning at 5 p.m. You can also watch the full service on our 11 Alive YouTube channel. We want to thank you for watching.
Turned through the safe, smashed in the windows of the car. Or bad parents. You haven't interacted with her in a year. I'm going to say two years. I live in the same house. I just can't talk to her. But you're her father. That's tomorrow. Then on Monday, worried parents. Taylor got down to 80 pounds. Repressed memories came up that her father had molested her. Have you ever been sexually inappropriate with your daughter? No. That's Monday. Closed captioning provided by... Publishers Clearinghouse winners are real. No kidding! You could be next. February 28th, win five grand.